we're going to now begin talking about the period known as the High Renaissance, and all of our discussion will once again center on Italy um, for the most part. Um, about 1492, the political influence of the Medici all but ended <coughs> when Lorenzo died. And so there was a decline in artistic patronage in Florence. Almost simultaneously, there was interest in art in the north of Italy that was led by the Catholic Church. The Pope became very in, interested in art and in paying artists um, to do work for the church. So, as you could probably expect, many artists went where the money was. Um, and so we sort of mark the beginning of the High Renaissance about the date 1503 when Pope Julius um, ascended to the papacy. Julius was a military leader um, as well as the highest leader in the church but he loved the fine arts and he summoned two very very important artists to Rome Raphael Sanzio who is referred to um, as Raphael and Michelangelo Boanardi who is also just referred to as Michelangelo um, whom I'm sure most of you have heard of before um, let's begin with a brief discussion of Raphael, though, because he's got some pretty important pieces that are very characteristic of the High Renaissance. Um, he was born in a town in Italy called Urbino, and Urbino was a major center of humanist learning. So he would have grown up um, being taught and being around the ideas of Renaissance humanism of human potential, of balance and order, and human mastery over chaos, and all of those very important humanist ideals. Um, he moved to Florence in 1505, and he worked there for about three years um, before the Pope um, brought him to Rome. And while he was in Florence, he painted a great number of what have become called the Madonna paintings. And here he developed a style that would become his trademark. So this is one of his Madonna paintings. And this happens to be called the Madonna of the Meadow. Um, and let's look a little bit about what's going on here and how this is very, very um, Renaissance in its composition and in its ideas. Um, first of all, you have a very biblical subject, Mary and Jesus. And again, in this painting, you can see the geometric mathematical precision in um, Raphael's work. You have the triangular composition that was so characteristic of the Renaissance with either Mary, in this case, at the top. Sometimes, of course, Jesus is at the top. Um, it's very balanced. Um, you've got that nature in the background, the, the figures in the foreground. Um, and so you also have in this painting this infusion of human qualities in the divine subject something that these Renaissance painters were very interested in. They were constantly trying to figure out how to bring together their religious beliefs along with this new idea of humanism. And so one of the ways they do that is to infuse divine um, figures in their works with very human you know, qualities. Um, and all of these are, are very much Renaissance ideals. So right after this painting, um, Raphael was summoned to Rome by Pope Julius. Um, Julius loved Raphael and commissioned him for many projects in the Vatican. He thought he was a fabulous painter, a very talented man. Um, Raphael also held some administrative posts. 
Um, for example, he was superintendent of the Vatican's antiquities, and he was the first architect of St. Peter's. So he was a very, very talented um, person. One of his jobs at the Vatican was to paint um, on the wall of the Stanza della Signatura. And this was just the office in the Vatican where the Pope signed all important documents. And these documents were prepared in this um, office, and then the Pope came there to sign them. So sort of it was a scriptorium, I guess, for lack of a better word. And so um, he did, Raphael did, and, and this is the... Um, painting that's on the wall in that office and it's called the School of Athens and it again it is very very characteristics of the classical ideals of the Renaissance. I want to tell you a little bit about what's going on here. First of all it's a homage it's paying tribute to the classical Greek philosophers Plato and Aristotle and as you guys know from Humanities 101, um, Plato and Aristotle were the two, or two of the most important classical Greek philosophers. So what you have here is um, Plato and Aristotle in the very center of the painting. And if you look closely, Plato is po pointing up and Aristotle is pointing down. Now this is so smart on Raphael's part because in these very simple gestures each of these philosophers is showing where they believe truth lies. For Plato it lies in a world above us or a, a world other than us, the realm of the ideal, the ideal truth, ideal beauty that the things on this earth are just a shadow of those ideals. And if you remember back to the allegory of the cave, um, that truth actually is shown to be um, something different than what the people in the cave thought. They just saw it as a shadow of something, and they believed it was true. But it was only when the person got out of the cave did he realize, oh, no, truth is is somewhere different than on this particular than on this earth and Aristotle pointing down shows the conflict in the philosophies of these two men Aristotle believed truth could be found in the things around us that it was through observation of many different types of things that we came to know what was true so he's very Raphael is very savvy in in doing that and communicating that with just those gestures um, and so we also see other Renaissance elements at work here. Not only is it this reflecting back to the classical past, but we see some other things. The architectural framework, very classically Roman, very Renaissance. Um, the subject matter, think about this. You've got Greek philosophy in the Vatican. Again, religion and humanism colliding. An artist trying to um, work out that contradiction or that seeming contradiction in a seamless way. Um, interestingly, even the Pope believed in the idea of philosophy and encouraged philosophy because he believed philosophy and the ability to think like that was a gift from God. Um, and so you have other important classical figures. You have Pythagoras calculating on a tablet. Um, and then you actually have um, Michelangelo in the painting. This is believed to be him here. Raphael is in the painting. Um, <clears throat> and so he, he mixes the classical with the Renaissance in this painting. Um, you can also see the balance and ordered space um, divided in half. And um, again, just a, a very classical um, tribute to humanism in a very religious space and them trying to sort out that balance. Um, this is Raphael's last work and it's a little bit different in my mind to what we've seen before. It was left unfinished. Now there's a lot more movement and a lot more emotion in this painting than in the others. Um, it's, it's pushing those limits of the 
calm, ordered, balanced space of the Renaissance. But you can see here it's still mathematically precise. Um, you've got the triangle position here with Jesus at the top ascending to heaven. You've got th definitely three levels, three layers of space here. Um, the light up here, God, um, and it gets darker as you go um, to you know, the world down here um, as Jesus is leaving and going up. And this is really considered a great moment in the High Renaissance as the emotion begins to be funneled into this particular painting. Now, I want to talk briefly about Michelangelo, and then after, after this, you're going to have um, some things to watch and, and some other things to do to play around with learning more about Michelangelo. Um, but I want to give a brief overview of him. Um, in Florence, he began his career um, in the sculpture gardens of Lorenzo Medici. There we have a Medici again. And he went to these gardens and learned to sculpt, copied them. He um, took one of his, Lorenzo saw one of his early pieces and was blown away um, by what a good job he did. And that was sort of how Michelangelo's um, career took off. Probably his best known early piece is David. And his David has become almost synonymous with um, Florence. So let's look at that. And, and you may have seen this um, before. It's 18 feet tall. And the, the story goes that he carved this from a block of marble that another artist started working on and then screwed up. So um, not only did he you know, sculpt this incredible 18-foot giant nude, but he did it with a, a, a piece of marble that someone else had messed up. Um, Michelangelo um, used to say that he could actually see the figures in the untouched marble trying to get out, and he felt it was his job to just chisel away the pattern that he saw to bring them out. He was a prolific sculptor, and um, supposedly he could um, chisel more block in a day, even as an old man, than many, many sculptors could do all together at the same time. So he, he was very, very gifted. Um, the David is a statement of idealized platonic beauty, the perfect male form. Um, how can we capture it? You know, that was one of the, the emphasis of these Renaissance artists. How can we capture in art the perfect idealized male form? Um, and it was placed outside the Palace Vecchio in Florence as a symbol of civic power. So it's set outside right in front of the basically city hall type building. Um, and anybody who came to the city hall had to pass it as they went in. And so it's supposed to be this symbol of, of might and power um, politically. Um, then in 1505, the Pope sum summoned Michelangelo to Rome to, to construct a tomb for him. Um, the tomb was never finished um, because Michelangelo kept getting interrupted. And then Julius died, and the new pope didn't care much about Julius's tomb. Um, but, but part of it was, was finished, the Moses part. And um, you can find that picture in, in your book. Um, but I want to talk mainly about the Sistine Chapel. Um, he was commanded, Michelangelo, um, by Julius to fresco the ceiling in the Sistine Chapel. Now... He didn't want to do this. Michelangelo did not want to do this. And he actually left Rome and said, I'm, I'm not going to do it. Well, you didn't tell the Pope no. And so the Pope, um, through his ways of persuasion, um, brought Michelangelo back to Rome, and he commenced this project. Um, this is an outline of the Sistine Chapel of what is on each of the panels 
and, and this is n a not very good picture um, of it. Your book, the picture in your book is much, much better. So I encourage you to turn there um, as, as we talk about it. Um, but there was great meaning in the panels of the Sistine Chapel. And if you just look for a few minutes, I uh, want to explain to you a little bit of what's going on. At each of the four corners, you have stories of the Old Testament heroes. Um, David against Goliath, Moses' rod becoming a snake, the story of Judith and Holofernes, which doesn't make it into the Christian canon, um, but it was in a very important Old Testament story nonetheless. Um, the eight triangles are the ancestors of Christ uh, mentioned in the Bible. Um, the ten <coughs> side rectangles um, are pagan sibyls and prophets of the Old Testament. So some of these represent wisdom in the humanist sense, while some represent wisdom in the biblical sense. So again, that meshing of, the, of humanism and religion that we see over and over again. And the nine center panels are stories from the book of Genesis. The creation of Adam, the creation of Eve, them getting kicked out of the garden, the flood etc. Um, now, many people talk about some important meanings behind the uh, panels in the Sistine Chapel. Um, for one, art historians and critics see a great deal of Neoplatonism, um, movement of darkness to light, um, from borders to center, um, the liberation of the spirit from this world, um, to the ideal realm, so to speak. Um, the depiction of ideal forms. Um, all of these are very platonic ideals that are seen in the Sistine Chapel. You also have Christian views of the Old Testament at Christ's coming. So you've got that, that part in there as well. Um, there's a great deal of tree symbolism. Um, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that's first mentioned in the book of Genesis to the tree of the cross that Christ was crucified on. And finally, the Pope's family was associated with um, a tree, an oak tree. Della Rovere was the last name of the Pope, which just meant of the oak tree. And then fourth, there is this connection that I mentioned before between human wisdom and God's revelation, the pagan sibyls and the prophets. So there's a great deal of meaning behind um, this particular um, painting. Now, one of the things that was interesting about um, the construction of the Sistine Chapel is that Michelangelo virtually did all of it by himself. Um, and he had many, many people that worked for him but because he was such a perfectionist, he virtually did the entire ceiling by himself. And he stood up to paint it. He stood on scaffolding and painted it. And he writes that he developed great neck problems, obviously, from looking up all the time um, during the construction. He got very frustrated with the Pope the Pope began to hound him about when he was going to be finished. Finally, Michelangelo um, just resorted and ans began answering the Pope, when I can. So it was a very stressful time um, of Michelangelo's life. And it was not, even though we look at, at it today as the great masterpiece that it is, Michelangelo ultimately considered himself a sculptor. And so... He, he did not enjoy this um, process at all. Um, <clears throat> Michelangelo w was one of the artists in the Renaissance that made a fortune being an artist. He was a very wealthy man during his lifetime and a very interesting man. And I hope that as you continue in the next couple of links, to learn more about Michelangelo, that um, you will really see the complexity of, um, of his character 
um, as well as just what an artistic genius that he was.